Uh, okay, so welcome everybody to the second session of the, the farm workshop. It's always a pleasure to, to see more lively it is. It could be more lively in terms of submission, so I invite everybody here attending farm also to consider submitting funny things. Uh, there are plenty of rooms for everybody. Uh, and I will give the mic to Orestis. Uh, we'll talk about music as a language. I guess I'm not betraying your title, putting an article in front of language, but anyway. Okay. Here it is for you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. So I'm going to be giving a rather simple presentation, uh, witnessing my experience on using uh, probabilistic temporal graph grammars to generate music automatically. Uh, and well, what this work has done, been done before by Donia Quick and Paul Kudak, uh, what they did is find sources in musicology literature and try to describe them. While doing so, I had to make several modifications that I will explain to the original form of this. So, uh, the goal here is not to generate something nice that you can dance to, but rather I take the generative music term uh, coined by Brian Nino, who well wants to have a process in his studio where he can like program stuff that, that infinitely generate music, then move to the other room, listen to it, write your emails, like do your work, and then find one sweet spot, and from that, like continue as a composer, like normally. So it's more like an aid and an infinite source of material that only some of them are interested. In. Uh, and you can do it in a lot of ways. You can like write JavaScript in uh, popular uh, music audio software. Uh, but here we are going for a principal manner, like a proper Haskell should do. And we're using formal grammars. Uh, so all this is possible because of previous uh, work presented at farm. Uh, and I will not explain the original form of this, but I will immediately explain my modifications and mention where they diverge. So these grammars are like context-free grammars, but with a few added uh, words in front. They are probabilistic, meaning that the rules have been assigned uh, a probabilistic way, so you could have multiple rules enabled at some point, and the one with a higher weight will be most probable to be fired. They're temporal, so the right-hand side of a rule that says what the original item should be replaced to are parametric over time. So you don't have to explicitly say for every duration value what you have to do, but you can be general. And there are graph grammars, meaning that they have a let construct that allows sharing expressions. So this allows repetition, musically speaking. And, of course, all of this is done in our favorite Haskell music library, Euterpe. Again, uh, treasure from uh, Donia and Paul. Um, and I just define some useful things that are not in the library, that are very easy to define, so it's not something novel, but just for completeness, I will show it here. First of all, we need the notion of intervals in the music theoretic sense. So we have up to 15 semitones, and uh, that's all you need in this case. Uh, Chords and scales are exactly the same thing. We view them as a set, uh, sequ uh, a sequence of uh, intervals from a starting note to an ending note. Uh, now, chord types are just this abstract thing that, so you cannot play it. It's like a major scale. Yeah, it's not in a particular pitch class. Then a semichord is something instantiated, so it's a C major scale. And then finally, something playable is a chord which you have said in which octave, which kind of voicing. So it's exactly something you can play. Um, and of course, you, I defined the, like the most usual chord types and scale types and have a, a little list that contains all of them and we'll use them when we're generating music. Um, and uh, the notion of transposition is important. Uh, so you can transpose a note by several tones or whatever. Uh, but you want to do it generically for 
any type you might consider. So you overload the, these operators in the type class and use it for all the music elements you might need. And finally, before I go into the formal ground section, uh, you will need some random action. This is fairly standard. You would typically have a weighted list that you would randomly pick elements based on their weight. More weight means more probable. And sometimes you want to equally uh, handle all the list elements. Uh, and the most important function here is choose that will actually do the, the logic I described. Like you can view it as a pie where the weight uh, determines the region you are entitled to, and then you just pick a random slice and, well, you pick this element. And sometimes you will use the choose by function that says, well, I don't have weights currently, but I have a function that can assign weights to the elements. And we'll use it for some heuristics later on. So uh, to the main topic, which are the probabilistic grammars, um, a grammar is, first of all, parameterized by a type A, which is the grammar symbols it will manipulate. The type variable meta will be used in a few slides for some metadata we'll handle, we'll ignore it for now. And uh, a grammar consists of a head, well, like the initial symbol that we have, always a single symbol, and a list of rules that will start manipulating symbols. Of course, you need a rule that rewrites this initial symbol, otherwise it, it would not do anything. Uh, and rules are with this funny little arrow, uh, where on the left-hand side you have the symbol to rewrite, so this rule applies only to these kinds of symbols. Uh, you have a weight, W here, and an activation function saying that, well, don't fire or fire that rule only on certain duration values. And on the right-hand side, we have the thing that we should replace in the, the sequence of symbols. And it's, as I said, parametric uh, to time, duration values. Here, the only modification to the original formula is the activation function. So uh, while I was trying to find grammars, we will see the examples in a bit, uh, all rules said, yeah, like only do it if this duration is high enough, more than a whole node. Um, and then, so these, these are written to some grammar terms, not atomic symbols, and these grammar terms are either atomic, a list of type A that are the grammar symbols we manipulate of some duration, or a sequence using this tensor operator. Uh, or, and here what's where the metadata comes in, we can wrap uh, a grammar term with some metadata that we'll use later on when we're actually generating music. And the let construct, which allows sharing or repetition. Uh, and here we also diverge from the uh, original formulas uh, because we use higher order abstract syntax instead of having a variable handing ourselves. So what we do basically is piggyback on Haskell's feature, because it already has variables and so forth, and using that to have like an effortless way of doing sharing. Now this changes, changes the semantics of how rewriting works, because lambdas are notoriously not introspectable. introspectable. Uh, so when you are rewriting, you will only be able to rewrite this thing and not the repeated form. And this is what we want, at least what the musicologists want when they're expressing grammars, because uh, they view repetition as exact repetition. Otherwise, you would repeat things, and then rewriting would change them. So you would have different results. And OK, for everything to work, the user also has to provide some type classes for uh, the associated types. and. Uh, one thing is to be able to remove all metadata you have. So this is the expand type class with some input, which will be our configurations. It will change every time. Uh, you can strip the metadata out a bit, possibly doing some random action. Instead of using monogram here, I, for brevity, I would just say it's in I.O. <coughs> and then, well, the, the data type of uh, metadata just becomes empty or unit. And you also want to have music in the end that you can play and we can hear. Uh, so you need to uh, be able to convert to some final type C that is actually playable in the uh, Euterpia. So it's, it can be converted to MIDI, basically. 
again with some input. And to, you put all of this together in a single constraint that says, are your types grammarly behaving? Uh, so if they should be able to expand them, uh, interpret them into some uh, playable music type, and you want equality because we will want to reach a fixed point, so we want to check equality between terms. Uh, and the rewriting is pretty straightforward. Of course, I have not put all the helper functions. But what you do basically is you have a total duration and a single uh, atomic symbol in the, to start with. You rewrite up to fixed point. Rewriting means going to the, all the constituents and applying the rules that apply, uh, applying the rules that may be multiple, so you probabilistically uh, pick them. Then you remove all the lets, so the repetition now is at the final stage and you repeat things, and you expand all the metadata. In the case of harmony, this will be key modulation. In the other grammars, it's not used, but uh, you may use it for whatever you want. And finally, you interpret using some initial configuration called the input here, this abstract structure to a playable music type. And you return this concrete music as well as the abstract. Maybe later stages will want to use this abstract information. For example, the melody will need to have the harmonic structure. So we'll first run the harmonic grammar, then give the abstract uh, structure to the melodic uh, grammar. So let's uh, go with uh, start with Harman, which is the most complex one, actually. It's based on this uh, popular paper by Rohrmeyer uh, that gives a c CFG, basically, for tonal harmony, Western tonal harmony, uh, and acts on like non-terminals that guide the process of uh, the rewriting. And finally, we, we only have terminals that say which degree of the scale we're in. Rohrmeyer only considered major and minor keys, but we will be like liberal to take any scale we want. And just an explanation of these uh, non-terminals, uh, we will have multiple stages. The first one will be a phrase, a total uh, a piece, sorry, uh, the total music piece. Then we will divide it into tonic regions, sub, uh, dominant regions, subdominant regions, a typical music analysis technique. And then finally convert them to degrees. So a dominant could be either a fifth degree or a sixth degree. And let's see the grammar. First of all, you will notice all the weights are equal. And that's why, uh, that's because uh, the paper was for analysis reasons uh, rather than generating reasons. Uh, and so I, instead of inventing ad hoc weights by myself, I said, well, let's just have equal opportunity for all the rules that apply. And you start from the piece, you divide it into bars of tonic regions, then elaborate these tonic regions to possibly dominant, subdominant ones. Here I've added a bit of my uh, own artistic uh, uh, yeah, handling, where I put repetition that was not existent in a CFG form, because you cannot express it. For example, when you're elaborating something to half of its duration, well, repeat it so we can have nice uh, harmonic themes. And then, okay, tonic regions will be transformed to T, D, and S, tonic, dominant, and uh, subdominant. And then at this point, we are doing modulation. So you can see here that P5, P4 are the intervals of perfect fifth, perfect fourth. And we are wrapping grammar terms with that that will later, at the final stage, be interpreted and say, well, transpose the whole uh, chord progression you have up a fifth or up a fourth. Uh, we also introduce some secondary dominance with repetition again. And finally, we are saying tonic is one, subdominant is four, uh, dominant is fifth, and so forth. And, uh, I think it's really close to the mathematical formulation. So that's why we use infix operations and all that. It's not to strain the programmer's eyes, but to keep a close resemblance between what we have in the musicology paper and what we write as programmers. And of course, Haskell, because it's an embedded DSL, Haskell allows to have this nice uh, list combination so we can easily write 
what we want with all the power of HUD. And then to expand the metadata and uh, interpret it as music, um, we want some configuration, like saying which kind of uh, pitch is the bass pitch, at which scale we want to do all that, and some selection of chords weighted. Most probably you would put uh, normal chords with more probability and then like more complicated chords with less probability. And then expansion is like trivial, just transpose the, the inner expression by the required interval. And when you reach the atomic symbols, you say, ah, it's a degree, let's choose out of all these chords, let's find the ones that are actually the degree of the scale and choose one randomly. And then to interpret it, uh, we, we, we also want, uh, we have the harmonic configuration, so we say, well now take all inversions, it's like very, there's nothing deep to it, take all possible inversions, try to, try to minimize the chord distance, like uh, yeah, a silly way of doing the chord voicing, and then choose one randomly and return it. So now we, this is, can actually be played. And just a very simple example, a partial example, you start with a piece of eight whole notes, you elaborate the tonic regions, uh, you, you elaborate the tonic region, the, uh, a tonic region of a half the duration and the dominant region, and after many steps using the metadata we saw and all that, you end up with degrees, possibly some key modulations, and possibly some leads that uh, I didn't have the space here to show. So uh, we we'll listen to the results later instead of just listening to harmony, a melody, and rhythm separately. Uh, let's see the melody example. Uh, this is based on a, a practical tool this time, not, it, it's not a theoretician's work, um, called Improviser for practicing jazz solo. And they like really carefully thought of all the weights that they should apply. Um, and well, it's not so intuitive to see the grammar actually because it's all non-intuitive, non-terminals uh, with some weights that you cannot possibly say how you came up with them. But it's practical and it works and it's a lot of rules. <laughs> and what basically that does is say, well, expand these nonsensical non-terminals uh, to finally notes, but not concrete notes, but characterization of notes. So this is actually uh, a scale tone or a chord tone based on some harmonic context. And in the tool, the user puts the chord sequence and this generates a solo where you can practice what you want. And the configuration is actually uh, a bit hacky. So you say, give me all the scales you want me to use, so the preference over octaves based on the instrument you will play it later, uh, and you just randomly pick uh, things to mark to minimize the distance again. Like I don't want too many jumps. Uh, the rhythm is even simpler, so I'm going into decreasing complexity. A very old paper by again a practical tool called Bolt Processor that is about tabla improvisations in the Indian classical instrument tabla. Uh, so it's about rhythmic improvisation this time. Uh, and it only works on syllables. That's how exercises are written in uh, Indian tradition. And again, some nonsense, non-terminals that just guide the process, tell you how much uh, duration you have. And then, well, you have a lot of rules that expand finally to syllables. These are the terminals, these are the non-terminals. And interpretation is merely uh, like uh, translating to MIDI values. This will depend on the MIDI map you have for tablas in your computer, but they're pretty standard nowadays. And then finally you get some, res some results. How do you do it? You get the configurations you want, like which key we're in, which chords we have, uh, and some melodic configuration. You run the harmony grammar. You then run the melody grammar with the abstract harmony not a concrete harmony, and then the rhythm and play them all together. So I will show you two examples, because I don't have time. 
the first one will not use tablets and will be like more of a classical result where we say we are in E minor based on the fourth octave. We are only using three chords, but with inversions is actually interesting, even. Uh, and only the major scale and the harmonic minor to put a little twist. And uh, it's meant to be played on the piano, so we take the proper octaves for the melody. So the, the program became self-aware and uploaded on <laughs> SoundCloud. <laughs> So there are many variations. a lot between different runs of the album. The harmonic minor here. So okay, that was a bit boring. So let's go to exotic oriental scales. So we use the Arabian scale, which not even the internet can agree on what it is. Uh, and it's not the Arabic scale. So anyway, I put the intervals just for your information. It's uh, similar to the Hungarian minor. And we say, use all chords, like 13s, diminished, altered chords, whatever. Use all scales that I currently have, which are a few. Uh, and play the melody. Uh, it will be played on the sitar, actually. And now also use the tabla, because it fits a bit with the genre. So let's see. Ah, sorry. This is a Romanian helmet, no. <laughs> It's not a magnificent uh, art piece, but it's still with very little effort, with a few lines of code, with not real customization, because I could speak actual weights on everything. So that's future work, actually. And I also want to have a more uh, like proper uh, combination between the two, because now we were playing Western harmony with sitars on the melody and tabla. Like, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Oh, that could be cool. It, it is cool, but you want more control at least. And there are very nice uh, grammars for jazz chord sequences, which would fit with our jazz improvisation melodic grammar by Mark Steedman, uh, but they have con context sensitive features. So, well, someone needs to extend this formalism to, to cover that. And the interpretation was pretty high, so I was, I was not really interested in generating music in it. I just wanted the mental part with the grammar. Uh, but for sure, Donia Quick again and Paul Huda have uh, examined a way where you can use actual principal mathematics to do this process, using chord spaces in this case. And I think uh, there is a lot of work for other people to like examine uh, mathematics that can cover this process, or even grammars. You never know. And, uh, yeah, you can write nonsensical grammars that don't, don't terminate, for example. And we are running up to fixed points, so it would be nice to have the type level constrain a bit what we can do. For example, uh, have a linear handling of time, because now we can get the time in the right-hand side and uh, remove it, or say, I'm not playing anything. So you would destroy the time structure of the piece. And of course, non-musical domains have been examined in this workshop, even. Um, and it would be nice to see how these extra features I added or modifications 
translate to animation, for example. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting work. I think. And just to end up with my favorite pianist's uh, quote, uh, it's got to be simple so people can dig it. This was referring to bebop songs. Uh, in our case, of course, it was not simple or catchy. But the process, so the music generation process, I think was pretty elegant and minimal. So, and I hope you dig it. Thank you. <laughs>